You know, we have this theme. We would like to welcome you all and welcome our panelists. The Builder Center has been exploring and the, the Cuba project within the Builder Center, issues of economic transformation in Cuba, reforms. And we've been doing that for quite a while before anyone else was studying it in the US. And we are proud to have made a contribution in that regard in many conferences and seminars over the years. The Cuba Seminars has been active in, in New York, has been active since 1995, 96. Uh, and uh, so this is, we have had a continuous run for all, for all these years. And we are proud and happy to be able to keep playing that role for you and for us and for everybody. Um, we are targeting the issue of economic reform because we think it's the most important uh, aspect of the reform process in Cuba at this point. In future editions of uh, our programs, we may focus on the politics or political economy of reform, transformation, and relationships with the area of culture, which we, hope we have also explored. Well, those of you who are interested in uh, the issue of uh, economic transformation uh, will appreciate that we have in May 20, on May 27th of 2014 a larger event. So today's event is really a kind of a planning component of that uh, step toward that process or that uh, occasion that in which we will engage in a more systematic analysis of the themes that concern us today, which is the economic transformation uh, outlook for 2014, and then taking stock of what has happened thus far. So today is just a uh, stepping stone toward that analysis. I mean, the, so we are delighted to welcome Pavel Vidal, who will be the first speaker, sitting to the left. He's currently an associate professor of economics at the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana de Cali in Colombia, as well as adjunct research scholar at the Columbia University. Um, he was a professor of the University of Havana since from 2006 to 2012, and he worked very effectively and in a wonderful team at the University of Havana, the Center for the Study of the Cuban Economy, SEEC. And uh, he just last year, as many young Cubans, uh, decided to pursue his interest uh, outside of the island, so he's now in, in, uh, in Cali, uh, Colombia. Mario Gonzalez Corso is Associate Professor of Economics at Lehman College, and uh, he's uh, an active uh, collaborator of what we do here at the Vilner Center, and he's written extensively on agriculture and various aspects of the Cuban economy, remittances and other topics. And uh, we look forward to a, a, a strong set of, uh, of events, discussions, with many of which will be public that uh, in the weeks to come and the month to come. And there, there may be some surprises for you that you will, I think you'll appreciate. And then lastly, there's a fellow here called Mauricio Fon, who will also be presenting <laughs> something, and that's me. But I will leave that for last. And I, uh, each, each speaker will have about 20 minutes or less. I, I certainly will do mine in about 10 minutes. It's una mentira, pero bueno. <laughs> I'll try to do mine in 10. And uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers after the presentations. Pavel is going to address a, you know, fun, a very hot issue right now, which is currency reform, monetary reform in Cuba. Pavel. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to, to make my, my presentation in, in English. It's a little bit slow, but to, to keep my reputation up in the debate, I'm going to speak Spanish, so I can improve my image. Uh, we have been uh, talking about the monetary duality for a long time. Uh, Cuba has been uh, bearing this strange situation of uh, having two currencies and two exchange uh, rates. Uh, in the early, the two currencies uh, was the Cuban peso and the dollars. But after 10 years, the central bank implemented a de-dollarization process. So 
today the the monetary duality is a little bit more strange because it's the parallel circulation of two national uh, currencies the q1 peso or cup and the convertible convertible peso or cuc so what i want to uh, talk uh, this afternoon is the the process that the the government is planning to implement for the next three years to uh, move the economy to a single uh, currency. The government of uh, Fidel Castro did not uh, did almost nothing to eliminate the monetary duality. However, uh, with the Raúl Castro uh, process of reform, the monetary duality, the elimination of monetary duality, seems to be a priority. We can see in that uh, documents, famous documents, the guideline for the economic policy, social and economic policy uh, up to 2016, that there is a chapter, chapter dedicated to the financial and monetary policy. In that chapter, uh, there are two objectives. One is the microfinance, which is uh, already in place. There is some uh, small but uh, positive outcome in the macro microfinance uh, uh, process. And there is a, a priority and a commitment, official commitment, to move the economy to a single currency. So far, uh, the government uh, what uh, what has been doing is trying to run, uh, run some experiments. Uh, and two months ago, uh, uh, the official uh, grandma newspaper released an official note that uh, give like the go ahead for the monetary reform. The guidelines and the overall uh, process of reform has uh, as deadline 2016. So we can assume that the monetary reform will share the same deadline. So we are expecting that Cuba in three years now will have again the Cuban peso as a single currency. I would like to, uh, we don't know the details of that, of that process of monetary reform. Uh, we know so, some consensus. We know that the government uh, is trying to, uh, to move the economy back to the Cuban peso. So the CUC is the currency that is, that is going to disappear at some point. We know that the government is not uh, planning to apply a big bang uh, monetary reform. They are going to apply a gradual approach but that gradual approach has a limited, which is uh, 2016. And there is a big gap between, between the two exchange rates. So the government has to implement a huge devaluation in three years. So the reform, uh, monetary reform, uh, could be gradual, but not that gradual. It has to be uh, uh, tough for the uh, enterprise system, the consequences of the devaluation. So I, I would like to uh, talk in my presentation about the most uh, likely actions and effects of this monetary reform, but for you to understand uh, a little bit better the monetary reform, I need to start, start by uh, explaining some characteristic of the monetary pol policy in Cuba, the tools, the transmission mechanism, the, the goals of the monetary policy in Cuba. Very briefly, because I only have uh, 20 minutes. As Mauricio, uh, Mauricio said, I, uh, used to wa I used to work for the Central Bank of Cuba. So I have, to, I have to recognize that the Central Bank of Cuba made some progress in the monetary policy uh, strategy in the 90s. The Central Bank of Cuba uh, was able to reduce the inflation in the 90s and was able to sustain the monetary stability. But I also have to, uh, have to recognize that the uh, monetary policy did 
just a little progress in some uh, aspects of the monetary policy, like transparency. Uh, we don't know the figures of the uh, money supply in CUC. We don't know the, the figures of the uh, foreign reserve held by the central bank, for example. And today, we don't know the details of the monetary reform. We know some, some aspects, but, but we don't know the details. The monetary policy di didn't uh, do any progress in the independence. The monetary policy in Cuba relies on the equilibrium of the fiscal uh, deficit. Monetary uh, policy in Cuba still is uh, printing money to finance the fiscal deficit, the so-called uh, monetization of the fiscal uh, deficit. The Central Bank of Cuba is not been using the conventional monetary policy uh, tools like uh, open, market, open market operations. Uh, uh, we still are using uh, direct and unconventional monetary policy tools like controlling the uh, level of salary, like control it, controlling directly the exchange rates, the interest rates. It's like the monetary policy in Latin America in the 60s, in the 70s. Uh, the Central Bank of Cuba is not been using the conventional monet, uh, monetary transmission mechanism through the banking system and credit. We are trying to control directly the supply uh, and demand in Cuban peso. To do that, the Central Bank of Cuba has some uh, unusual uh, tools, which is uh, this one that I am showing in my slide, an estimation that I did with uh, an econometric model that you can see the significant effects the dynamic effects from six months to one year of this instrument. The central bank sells dollar to Minsing so that they can encourage the uh, sales of Cuban uh, pesos, uh, of uh, products in Cuban pesos. So the central bank of Cuba uh, has not been controlling the money supply, uh, buying and selling bonds, bank, but uh, buying and selling uh, products, Cuban peso products. It's unusual, but it's, it's, it's been working. You can see in the data of the inflation that the Central Bank of, of, of Cuba, instead of this strange uh, monetary policy stra strategy, has been able to uh, reduce and control the inflation rate since uh, 1994. In fact, uh, low inflation is uh, one of the advantage of the uh, current uh, economic reform in Cuba. We can see in the guidelines and the whole process of, of Raul Castro's reform that the reform is not focused in a stabilization program. There is not need for a stabilization program because the inflation is low. So monetary and the economic policy can focus on the uh, elimination of the dual currency, can focus, can focus on the liberalization process and the structural reforms. That's one of the advantages of the Cuban reform today if you compare with the reform in the early 90s. <coughs> However, uh, this uh, inflation path can change. I mean, the, uh, all the process of monetary reform would uh, lead to a significant devaluation of the official exchange rate that can result resulted in a higher inflation. And we, uh, we, uh, we can connect these figures with the uh, roots, the origin of the monetary duality. In this period of uh, high inflation, 
what happened in Cuba was uh, that people started to substitute the US dollar by the Cuban peso because of the high inflation and also because of the devaluation of the exchange rate of the Cuban peso, uh, people uh, lost confidence in the Cuban peso and substitute so to the US dollar. In this figure, we can uh, find the reasons why Cuba has now two currency. The monetary deal in Cuba started as a process of a partial dollarization. This dollarization started in the inform informal market, but later, later, the government used the dollarization to promote stability, to promote the uh, a, a group of sectors that will be uh, very important for the recovery, recovery of the crisis. The government used the, the US dollar to promote the entrance of remittances, to promote foreign direct investment, to promote export, to uh, promote stability in the economy. So monetary development in Cuba started as a process of partial dollarization that uh, at the beginning was an informal dollarization, but later it was an official dollarization. Monetary dollar in Cuba means two things. One is the dual currency, but at the same time we have, we have a dual exchange rate system. And it also has to do with the crisis in the early 90s. We can see, we can see here the devaluation of the exchange uh, rate that also started in the informal market, and after that, the government assumed that devaluation uh, of the exchange rate. But in the case of the exchange rate, the devaluation was only assumed for the, uh, what, what we call in Cuba, cadeca, which is the house, I don't know how to say in English, house of, of exchange. Exchange, of exchange rate, which is only uh, using or applying operation with uh, people and tourists. So the devaluation was never taken into the balance sheets, financing or, or trade operation of the state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises, as SOAC, SOEs are working even today with the exchange rates of the 80s. So we have a multiple exchange rate system. One to one, one Q1 peso to the dollar is the official exchange rate. And the other, the other exchange rate is 24 to one. But this exchange rate is only, only applying for uh, tourists and uh, people. So the Q1 exchange rate adjustment in the 90s was incomplete since it took place only in the household sector. Today, Raul Castro government has to implement the devaluation of the official exchange rate that did not happen in the early 90s and has been postponed for more than 20 years. After the partial dollarization of the economy, we have the parallel circulation of the Cuban peso and the dollar for uh, 10 years, from, from 1993 to 2003. In 2003 and 2000, 2004, the Central Bank of Cuba implemented, implemented a de-dollarization process. But the US, uh, USD was not uh, replaced by the, by the for the Cuban peso, but for a third currency, the, C the CUC. That's how we uh, were able to de-dollarize de the economy, but the monetary duality remains. 
in the future, what the OMN is planning to do, to the best of, of my knowledge, is to move the economy back to the Q1 peso. So in the future, the, the COC is going to disappear and the economy will have as a single, uh, as a single currency, again, the Q1 uh, peso. On the other hand, the dual exchange rate system has not shifted at all in the last 20 years. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know the details, but I think that the, what the government is planning to do for the monetary reform is to devalue, I mean increase this exchange rate, devalue the CUP against the dollar, but is planning to uh, remain fixed this, this exchange rate, the Kadek exchange rate, and is also planning to keep fixed the CUC exchange rate. The main measure that the government is going to implement to get rid of the monetary duality is the devaluation only of the official exchange rate. I know that uh, there is an expectation and people is uh, looking forward to see a revaluation of the Cadeca exchange rate. But in my opinion, that is not going to, to happen in the short term. Maybe that could be a medium term effect, an aftermath of the monetary reform, but not a short term impact. As I said, we don't know the details, but, but we, we know so consensus. We know that they are, try, they are going to try to reestablish the COP as a single currency. They are trying to devalue the official exchange rate, and they are trying to uh, do it as gradual as possible. Uh, the gradualism can be implemented in two, uh, with two options. One is the economy-wide gradualism, which means uh, be, to be applying small but systematic devaluation of the exchange rate for all SOEs. But the approach that the, it seems to be the one that the government is going to, to, to take in place is try to select some uh, enterprises and apply it a stronger devaluation in those sectors. It's, it means that they, they are going to use the most likely monetary stra strategy to eliminate the monetary duality will be a devaluation a devaluation, a strong devaluation in some uh, sectors. So far, we know about some experiments that uh, has been uh, implemented in the relation between private farmers and cooperatives and the hotels in a group of SOEs in the sugar industry in the, and in the transport transportation cooperative. In all the cases, they are not using the official exchange rate, but a more devaluated exchange rate. Except the case of the industry, of the uh, sugar industry, the average exchange rate that is using in that experiment is 10 Q1 peso to one uh, CUC and to one dollar. Consequently, the current signals point to a sector by sector monetary reform with a strong devaluation of 900% in the first stage of the reform. The devaluation of the official exchange rate will bring about cost and benefits. The devaluation of the official exchange rate will change all the financial situation of SOEs. The devaluation will put stress on the accounting and the financial situation of SOEs, especially 
especially in the balance sheet with that kind of situation of mis uh, mismatch currency. Some uh, SOEs with, uh, that today have a profit will have to go into bankruptcy after the devaluation. That will be one of the costs. Another cost has to do with the, the so-called uh, pass-through effects. If you uh, devalue the exchange rate, that devaluation can go through uh, all the uh, enterprise system uh, and resulted in uh, higher prices for consumer. So the devaluation will, will have, as another cost, a higher inflation rate. The paradox is that all that cost are for a good end. This is an unavoidable shock, but that has to be applied in order to get, to get more transparent and uh, ba more transparent balance sheets and more transparent relative prices. So they can reflect the actual efficiency and productivity of the SOEs. This is one of the balance that has to that have to be uh, get for the government. They, they have to apply a shock, but that has to be a shock that can be managed for SOEs. No, no, I haven't finished. Okay. Okay. I know it's very complicated, very interesting, fascinating stuff, central mm -hmm. in the coming weeks to come, so please do take three of my minutes. Okay. <laughs> of your minutes. Thank God. So we have two costs, inflation and the uh, effects on the balance sheets of enterprises. But at the same time, we will have some benefits. That benefits will be uh, located in the uh, export, in the, uh, all the tradable, tradable uh, sector. They, they will uh, see, after the devaluation, uh, some gain in profitability and uh, competitiveness. Uh, the key point here is that we have to count on the response of SOEs in any a process of devaluation, you, ha you, have, you uh, usually have uh, losers and winners. Uh, usually, the winners is the private sector, and the losers is the state sector. But in the case of Cuba, the private sector is already working with the devaluated exchange rate. I mean, micro, uh, micro enterprises, the cooperative are working with the exchange rate 24, 24 to 1. So they, they, they will not receive any uh, gain from the devaluation. We have, to, we have costs and benefits, and the benefits of the devaluation depends on the uh, response of SOEs. So that's why I am suggesting to uh, implement the monetary reform together with a structural reform in SOEs. SOEs needs uh, autonomy, autonomy to, to, to be able to react and to make the most of the devaluation. At the same time, it's important to uh, line the incentive of workers in SOEs with the effects of the devaluation in the balance sheets of enterprises. I don't see any effects of the devaluation in foreign direct investment. I don't see any effects of the devaluation in the private sector. And I don't see any effects of the devaluation in the purchasing power of salary. I don't see any effects of the devaluation in the so, uh, economic inequalities in Cuba. I think that the purchasing power of salary and inequality has nothing to do with the monetary uh, duality. The, another key point, to use uh, effectively the, another minute, 
is that with the devaluation, you will have a certain and short-term cost. And on the other hand, you will have potentials and medium-term benefits. So there is a gap between the cost and the benefits. And that's the, the, the place, the, 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 the role that has to be played by the fiscal policy. The fiscal policy has to bridge this gap, this time gap between cost and benefits. And I will jump to the conclusions. I have to read it. I recommend a gradual approach for the Cuban monetary reform because of the structure of the economy based, based on SOEs and because we don't have to be afraid of have uh, any kind of speculation of uh, related to inf capital inflow or capital outflow, because in Cuba we, we can control the capital movement. The government must announce uh, the sequences of the monetary reform to reduce uncertainty, and the structural reform in SOEs must be implemented. Fiscal policy must bridge this gap between short-term costs and medium-term benefits. And the Central Bank of Cuba needs to enhance the monetary policy strategy in order to sustain the stability and credibility of the single currency, the Cuban peso, after 2016. Finish. A very rich, very nuanced analysis of uh, the situation of the dual currency reform in Cuba. Probably the key reform in the weeks and months to come, and years. I guess you said a margin of three, three years, huh? 2015. Uh, Pavel has identified likely winners and likely losers, and he has given us a very um, interesting study of. Uh, or perspective on, on what we need to focus on in, in, in the near future. Mario, I mean, many of us think that a monetary reform has to happen with the reforms in the production systems, and they would be unthinkable unless they happen at the same time. You need to have more production to sustain these uh, major transformations of the, of the economy, of the currency. We see that in Latin America and other experiences where Attempts at manipulating with monetary policy has led to inflation, very high inflation, explosive inflation in the 80s and the parts of the 90s and before. And um, only when that was accompanied by sustained uh, expansion in the productive sector were you able to uh, accomplish the dual goals of uh, growth, uh, reform and uh, structural reform and monetary reform. Mario is going to dwell, dwell on uh, one aspect of the, the reforms in Cuba that is perhaps uh, central also to this whole equation that I used to sketch to you, which is a transformation of the agricultural sector. Mario. Okay, so, so thank you everyone. Um, good afternoon. And I wanna say that it's a pleasure to, to have Pavel here who is a, a friend and a colleague from a long time. It, it's also a pleasure to, uh, to have everyone here. Um, back in September, we, we had a panel in which I presented uh, the chapter uh, that I wrote in the Handbook of Cuban Studies uh, book that we published, which was basically an overview of the, of the agricultural reforms in Cuba. And so when we organized this panel, um, I offered to talk about agriculture, but I, I promised to say, to, to try to at least say a few new things. And so, um, that, that's the, the purpose of my uh, presentation today. So um, basically, uh, three topics in my presentation. The first one is how I, I looked at official statistics uh, from uh, about Cuban agriculture, and I found some new data regarding land or under cultivation and, and, of course, production, right? So that will be the first topic. Uh, and, and then, of course, the second topic is to talk a little bit about the principal regulatory updates, and there are three updates, basically, 
uh, dating back to the late summer. The first one is sales of agricultural products to tourism enterprises. Um, the second one is a bigger one, which is the commercialization of agricultural products, a, a change in the supply chain, if you will. Um, and the third one is one that's pretty much forthcoming, which is a, the restructuring of the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. And then in the final topic, I'll talk about the, uh, the, what, what I perceive to be the outlook for, uh, for 2014. Um, let me preface uh, my presentation also by saying that um, I will talk about non-sugar agricultural production. So it doesn't include the industrial component. It doesn't include the sugar component. So in terms of land under cultivation, what I did was I found some data for the first quarter of 2013. And if you look at the tables here, um, you'll notice that for most of the crops, basically land under, under cultivation declined. And we see notable decreases in potatoes, uh, plantains, um, tomatoes, and so on, right? Beyond us, which is a whole uh, bunch of uh, staples that are vital to the Cuban diet. So, what I found was, without getting into the econometrics of it, is that this had a negative impact on output, and I'll show you the data for output shortly, but it had a positive impact on yield as long as the rate of change in production was greater than the, rate, than the negative rate, rate of change uh, or reductions in land under cultivation. So in other words, we will notice, uh, and, and if you compare the Cuban agricultural sector to other um, agricultural sectors, uh, you'll notice that this is a typical trend, right, to reduce the amount of land dedicated to, to, to agriculture. Um, not surprisingly, um, I looked at output, and I found uh, three things that I'm highlighting here. So there's a total production compared to the first quarter of last year. So there you see the total production, and then it's broken down by state sector on the non-state sector. And every time when I compare the state sector and the non-state sector, the, the, the numbers that appear on red are the percentages in which one of the two had a lowest result during the first quarter of 2013. And so just a couple of things I want to highlight from here. Um, one of them, of course, is that if you look at total output, right, and, and you compare the first quarter of 2012 versus the first quarter of 2013, you'll notice that in the same crops where land declined, Production also declined. I mean, that's normal. That's to be expected. There's less land uh, allocated to agricultural production, and therefore the impact would be less production. Okay. Um, so notice the the very significant decreases in corn, in plantains, in potatoes, viandas, etc. Uh, you notice also that there's some sectors where, or some crops in which actually the state uh, produces more output than the non-state sector. All right, so, so this is part of the transformation of agriculture where the production is being realigned by sector. Um, of course, if you look at total production uh, from the crops that I have here, there are only a few that perform better than they did in 2012. So what are the key takeaway points in terms of production, you know, looking at this very limited data that we have for the first quarter of 2013? Right, uh, which by the way was not published by, by September, so I couldn't um, include this in, in our work that we did in September. But I noticed that in crops where, in which the, the state sector exceeded the non-state sector, typically if you look at the non-state sector, we have the UBPCs, right? The Unidades Básicas de Producción Cooperativa. Um, and, and those, my, my take on this data is that the UBPCs are actually dragging down the non-state sector. In other words, if you take them out of the equation, uh, and, and I know they've been transformed recently, um, non-state production would, would increase. Um, or, or, or let me put it differently, the indicators of non-state production will be different than what the table is showing here. Um, the other uh, key takeaway point is that if you look at rice and corn, I call them transition crops. Not transition in the you know, traditional sense of transition, but basically where the shifting composition of these crops, it's being manifested through the production data. Meaning, for example, if you look at rice production, uh, the non-state sector produced more, right? The, or, or, or we can look at the, at the rates and we can say, well, non-state production was actually bigger. The opposite happens with corn. Uh, 
So uh, in the case of corn, state production was greater than non-state production. So, so these are, th this is typical in agricultural transformations or what some people like to call post-socialist agricultural, agricultural transformations where you have some crops that are being realigned. And so in the case of Cuba, um, rice and corn are two examples of those crops. Um, so then I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the regulatory updates. Uh, there's a lot to say about these. I I'm sure some of you, if not most of you, are familiar with some of these updates. But um, I, I want to highlight the, the first update is basically direct sales of agricultural products to tourism enterprises. I mean, this is new. This is part of the change of the intermediation uh, process and the supply chain of agricultural products. So, so there are a couple of things that I wanted to highlight here under key provisions. One of them is the expanded product category. And, and, and what this is basically pointing out, uh, highlighting in my view, is sort of the micro-oriented um, nature of the transformations in the agricultural sector. I mean, specifically, they're saying these are the product categories that could be sold directly to the tourism enterprises. Uh, so so uh, as Pavel mentioned, uh, this is an example of gradualism. I also say this is an example of micro, mm, I don't want to say micromanaging, but the, the micro focus of the agricultural reforms. Another key point here is that prices um, follow Resolution 9, which was implemented in June of 2013, and, and there is a flexibilization of prices. So, so we can say, well, there is a price reform or a gradual or partial price reform because prices could be directly determined now by buyers and sellers, buyers being the tourism enterprises subject to the new tour, and sellers being state and non-state agricultural producers and intermediaries. Um, a, a, a final point here, so I can move on to the better, to, uh, not the better, but to the more significant change. A final point here is regarding tax payments and collection. And so basically, Casa Financiera del Turismo Fin Tour and the banking system now have a sort of tax collection function. So, so this is very unusual in these kinds of agricultural reforms. But it's there. And it's, they're alluding to Decree Law 113, which was approved back in 2012, which talks about the, um, the tax collection system. Now, the other, and, and I wrote a lot about this here, um, the other reform um, you know, policy reform or policy measure, uh, regulatory update is commercialization, this experiment of commercialization of agricultural products. Uh, I, I call it direct commercialization. And in essence, I'm referring to the Cree Law 318, which is basically an experimental um, measure that has been implemented in Havana. Uh, as you know, Cuba has restructured its, its provinces. So, Havana, Artemisa, Mayabeque, and so on. And another key point here is that there's a plan to expand this nationwide by 2015. So what does this mean, basically? Um, to summarize all the uh, bullet points that I have here, uh, one, uh, one meaning of this is that it means decentralization of the commercialization of agriculture. And you can find a reference to that in the lineamientos 183 and 181. 181 talks about uh, calibrating supply and demand, making sure that through a more flexible system of commercialization, supply and demand are better calibrated. And lineamento 183 really goes right after what they call more efficient agricultural um, commercialization, meaning uh, dismantling the state, uh, you know, the, the functions of acopio and so on, not dismantling, but restructuring Acopio as well, and basically expanding uh, the commercialization of agricultural products. Another key point here about um, decentralization is this creation of provincial administration councils that will really, uh, now at, at, a, at a decentralized level, not at the Ministry of Agriculture, the, the administration councils will be responsible for implementing Decree Law 318. What, something else that actually caught my eye was that <clears throat> here we go with a, a very micro detailed list of products that are not subject to this new regulation of regulatory update. So beef, milk, coffee, honey, tobacco, cocoa, etc., are excluded from this regulation. 
And potatoes are subject to, to social consumption requirements, which means the fulfillment of contracts uh, between producers and the state so that potatoes are delivered to centers of social consumption, hospitals, schools, daycare centers, and so on. All right. Um, so I continue with the same decree, which, which to me is the most significant update since September. Um, and, and, and now we talk about who are the authorized participants. And, and, and here's the list. We have the state sector. And of course, what, what's, what's new about this is the non-state sector, so which includes the UVPCs, the Cooperativas de Producción Agrícola, the Cooperativas de Crédito y Servicio, private farmers, self-employed self workers who are not farmers, who are basically private uh, intermediaries. The resolution talks about carretilleros, but it's more than the carretilleros. It's actually private uh, individuals who are licensed to commercialize, to sell, to broker agricultural products. Uh, something else that caught my eye that I think it's new is what are the retail outlets? And, and the one that's there on the first, on the top of my list, which are the mercados agropecuarios uh, estatales, are being transformed into what are, co what are called non-agricultural cooperatives. So these are basically, are now uh, no longer, although the title remains in some cases and so on, just to give you an update, there's 77 of those in Havana, and I counted 22 in Artemis and Maya Vega. So we're talking about 99 um, mercados agropecuarios that have been sort of transformed into non-agricultural co cooperatives. Um, and the, uh, also a new development is the mercados arrendados, which are basically these newly created markets or outlets that are leased by the state to the non-state producers. Um, I, I want to pause here and say that there's a quote by um, Marino Murillo, where he talks about changing gestion or changing manage, management functions, administrative functions, without changing or altering the property forms in agriculture. So that's something to bear in mind. It's not just sin prisa, sin prisa pero sin pausa, and all that kind of stuff, but it's also the conceptual framework of changing the management of agricultural enterprises, changing the managerial practices, administrative practices, but not changing radically the property form. That's a key point behind all these regulatory updates. Um, retail prices are uh, divided into two categories, those that are fixed by the Ministry of Finance and those that could be negotiated uh, between sellers and buyers. Another development are the mercados de abastos, which are basically, I guess in English I call them wholesale outlets or wholesale markets. I think outlets would be probably better. Uh, they're located in Havana only as an experiment, and this is basically where enterprises, this is not at the retail level, this is the, at the wholesale level, enterprises can come and purchase um, agricultural products directly at wholesale prices from the uh, producers, right? Including, and, and not only from the producers, but I'm going to harp on it again, including intermediaries. And so at the bottom here we see intermediaries and we see new forms of intermediation, which is also new which are self-employed workers that are licensed to be agricultural intermediaries and cooperatives. And in parentheses, I put there that the cooperatives are exempt from paying sales taxes uh, for the first three months uh, as a way to incentivize the development of these kind of intermediary-based cooperatives. Uh, the minister uh, did say in a, in a, in a speech that uh, the, the updated uh, agricultural model would give a greater priority to cooperatives rather than self-employed workers. So they receive preferential tax treatment, and, uh, and down the line, there, there are many uh, different reforms coming, I think, to, to give priority to cooperatives. Um, then the third leg of this update is the, the plan restructuring of the Ministry of Agriculture. And it's broken down into three phases. As you can see there, we have the budget system first quarter, next month of 2014 to the first quarter of 2015, updating, uh, modernizing the budget system, transforming that system. Uh, the second phase is the creation of provincial enterprises, empresas provinciales, something new also, uh, the, from the second quarter of 2014 to the second quarter of 2015, and then phase three, replacing the provincial and municipal delegations and so on. But if you look on the other measures, I found these two to be very significant. Right, provincial enterprises will be transferred away from the ministry to provincial administration and the fusion of 15 agricultural research stations. As most of you probably know, 
Cuba has developed an, an extensive degree of experience in agricultural research. And so they're now looking at, uh, you know, joining those um, stations with some from the Ministry of Science, Technology, and the Environment. So, so that's part, sort of like an administrative reform. Um, so the question that came up, uh, the theme of our panel is, what is the outlook for 2014? And uh, it's difficult, uh, right, when you have such a complex system as agriculture. But a few points here, I think there will be a continued emphasis on updating the agricultural supply chain and distribution network. So resolution 318 expanded, modified, or as the Cubans like to say, perfected, right? Getting closer to, to perfection. Um, another outlook or part of the outlook is if we look at output, the same trend, lower output, higher yields as land is reduced and as the reduction of land is greater than the declines in output. Okay, in output. Um, another uh, component, I think, will be the expansion of agricultural input markets, but with limited results because of you know, some existing constraints and so on. The other uh, point, I think another significant element in, in the agricultural sector in 2014, if we look forward, uh, I think it's reasonable to expect a gradualist uh, approach to restructuring using experiments, right? The, the Cubans seem to discover that experiments are a good way to see if things are going to work. Um, so I mentioned here an experiment that, that's taking place in the Isla de la Juventud, which is basically providing, creating input markets where agricultural producers, state and non-state agricultural producers can buy inputs, you know, a, a, a list of inputs at moderate, at, uh, at, at fair prices or moderate prices in Cuban currency, right? We're talking about monetary duality, so this is, this is an experiment. Um, the next point, I think that um, I read the, a couple of reports uh, from people in agriculture uh, in Cuba, and they're saying that the market will continue to be, the, the wholesale market and the retail market will, will remain segmented into different uh, delivery channels or retail channels to ensure competition. I, I don't remember exactly who said this, but there was an, an official who basically um, made this comment, which I found uh, that I agree with, because it, it would be very difficult to unify. If monetary uh, unification is difficult, imagine unifying all those markets. I would, that's an also, also a big project. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions sort of thinking ahead towards 2014, and one of them is, will there be an extension of Decree Law 318? Meaning, will they continue to expand the commercialization of agricultural products? Will, will it be rolled out nationally, and what would be the impact of that? My other question has to do with Decree Law 300, which came out in October of last year, which is basically expanding the transfer of uh, idle uh, you know, state lands to to cooperate, you know, to to non-state producers on their use of runs. So my question is, will that continue? Right? The, 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 the I haven't read much about that. That's just a question that came up. And then, of course, the final question mark re relates to the Ministry of Agriculture and the restructuring of the Ministry of Agriculture. Will that be executed during the time frame? that a very aggressive time frame uh, published, announced by the Cubans. So I conclude my, my presentation saying that the big question mark in agriculture is where else can agriculture go, I mean. Uh, so thank you very much. OK. Thank you, Mario. You know, the complexities in the, re the reform process in Cuba, and yet, evidence of major change. I'm almost tempted to, perhaps with some sense of humor in relation to New York City, call the situation in Cuba this, the, the ta a tale of two brothers. Fidel Castro, as I will attempt to show, insisting on a very centralized model, and then Raul Castro, as uh, Pavel emphasized, insisting on a reform process involving decentralization, new forms of of production, currency reform, and the like. Uh, so 
And so I, I will start with the same, the same kind of uh, introduction that I used last time here, then I will shift the emphasis. There's a serious reform process, reform drive, actualization, updating, lineamientos, sin prisa pero sin pausa, gradualism has been reaffirmed by both speakers before me. Uh, and then in a series of reforms. It reminds us of uh, the competition of, between reform processes, Cuba and uh, the Soviet Union, the, the hare and the rabbit, and uh, the rabbit being the, the shock therapy of the Eastern Bloc and Russia, and, uh, which one will come ahead and win, win in the end. So with Raul Castro's approach performed like the fabled tortoise, but in the end beat the hare's big bang to the finish line. Well, as we know, the many, certain, few at least, of the Eastern European countries, including Russia, faced years of abyss and collapse and failure. Will Cuba's gradualism be able to evade or prevent that from happening in Cuba? And will Cuba, therefore, will be able to come ahead and finish uh, with a degree of success in the reform process? Um, I think to make sense of that in a broader context, you need to put, you need to look at what happened with, with in, after 1986, and again, tale of true brothers. After in 95, when Russia went and this old Soviet Union went through a reform process, Cuba insisted in reaffirmation of traditional centralization uh, and the, the elements of that uh, of that uh, reaction of, at that time are listed here. It was the third Congress of the Communist Party. Rectification, and it was a reaffirmation of the policies of the past, a critique of bureaucracy, meaning, uh, meaning kind of planning, modern planning like the Soviets. Uh, material incentives and farmers' market were to be rejected in favor of more return to volunteer work, agrarian collectivization, the kindling of modern incentives, and the primacy of uh, politics over economic considerations. And uh, throughout this whole process, a reaffirmation of Fidel Castro's personal leadership and style of, 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 of building socialism in Cuba, uh, still adaptive practices from below, which we deal with in another presentation, could not be stopped. Uh, the, the whole story, as Pavel and both uh, Pavel and, 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 and uh, Mario insisted, it starts with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Just, and then the uh, decrease in output in the Cuban economy, which was real in just about all sectors, services, industry, and agriculture. It was a 35% contraction, at least, perhaps more. And then we see a very interesting period, which is a, is, you know, a special period. And you, you all, we all know this, but it, essentially the elements of, uh, and I think Pavel alluded to this and Mario as well, the elements of the current reform process, which starts, starts later, Get a, get a defined at that time. And uh, it was uh, some degree of, of liberalization, expanded foreign investments, tourism, farmers' markets, uh, remittances, and legalization of the dollar. And Pavel uh, you know, told us how those measures at that time were, uh, were designed to the exchange rates to, in, to provide incentives for, remit for both those the, the direct foreign investment and the remittances. Uh, the, the crisis of, Cuban, of the Cuban economy is major. The sugar production collapses just brutally from uh, eight, seven, eight million to one million or so, uh, uh, one thousand, thousand tons. And so do exports, and of course they lose out to Brazil, who which wins out in this race, this particular race. Now the. What is interesting is that the initial reform phase, and again, we are revisiting this, I think we need to keep going back to this, is uh, the socialist reaffirmation uh, uh, that happens again in 1995, uh, after, after 1997. And uh, the Fidel Castro again takes the helm and insists on the battle of ideas to return to uh, post-1999 mass mobilizations Leon Gonzalez case, Hugo Chavez elected in 1998, very important episode in this whole equation. And then uh, it's only Fidel Castro's illness in 2006 that brings an end to this cycle of alternations. The question that I pose for you is, 
Will this cycle of reform, stop goal reforms, continue in Cuba, or will it be broken now by Fidel Raul Castro's reforms? Um, the elements of the constitutional, there's a constitutional revision 2002, uh, reaffirming socialism as the fundamental form of organization of the Cuban, of the Cuban economy. Uh, there are prohibits in international negotiations while Cuba is subject to aggression, threat, or coercion from a foreign power. But the main thing is the emphasis on socialism. Uh, the reform process that uh, we have been discussing starts in 2008 with Raul Castro. And we all know what the main elements of that whole process is. So I'm going to rush through. We don't have that much time. Uh, the, the reality of it is that the, the economy transforms itself. And you see the services sector uh, in the year after 1997 take off. This is, this is the services abroad, mostly, and, and tourism. Grow, expanding very fast in Cuba. So Cuba becomes a service-oriented export economy in many ways. If you, if you focus on tourism and, and uh, medical services to, to Venezuela and other places. Now, let's look at this very fast. I mean, this is not very fast, actually, with some attention. This period in which of socialist reaffirmation, which lands in 2008, 2009, but then there is kind of a inertia. Look at the owner, the, la the labor force employed by the state. It, it had de decreased to 76.9% in 1997 as a result of the special period. And then you see it expand, grow again because of this relationship to Venezuela and the reaffirmation of the state. 79% to 79, 80, 82, peaks in about 2009 with uh, 83.8, and then it begins to contract. There are some different kinds of different data. Uh, I'm growing from Rundenius and from 97, 2007, and 2010, and the rest of the data come from ONE, the, the uh, statistical office in Cuba. Uh, so the non-state sector, again, uh, expands uh, in the 90s, then contracts in, to release because this, this is being centralized, and then it's beginning to grow again. And actually, people are saying that, is, that the aim is to 20%, but I, the data that we have from ONES itself is 22.3%. Uh, so it seems that indeed the private economy, the non-state economy, in terms of employment, is, is expanding. But again, that shows you the two very different styles of, of organizing the human economy, one centralized in which labor is, uh, the state is responsible for employing people and one in which a non-state sector is really uh, drawing a lot of the labor and increasing with increasing rapidity. So presumably what we will have to look forward to in the years to come will be an expansion of this, uh, of this process. Uh, the debate continues, uh, propositions, uh, we don't have time for this. I, I think I want to rush because we want to open up the question and answer period. And I had some data indicators. We, many, I think there has been an acceleration of reform, at least in terms of the a declaration of, of intent of, in 2013. It includes, as, more, as Mario pointed out, food distribution networks and wholesale markets, the, the cooperatives, both agricultural and non-agricultural, uh, deregulation of state enterprises and travel, travel liberalization. Uh, and, and migration, very important item in there. Uh, reducing, eliminating food subsidies, the ration card for direct investment is being encouraged. We have a study that are uh, in progress on what we are likely to expect from the Mariel uh, special zone, whatever term you want to prefer to use. And then uh, the, there's an overall private sector expansion. And there are other measures under study. Again, we will be, today we are just presenting this, uh, we're taking stock of what has happened and is likely to happen in the near future. And in May, we will have a colloquium that hopefully will go more uh, in, in more depth and address some of the, the progress in, that has been made in these areas. Um, again, we don't have time for the progress. We just reviewed them and you know, each, each of the areas that I just mentioned. Uh, 
Mariel, we went through that. And uh, I think the, with, on the Mariel issue, one of the questions for me is the extent to which the Mariel uh, investments will be only for foreigners as, as, as opposed to Cubans. Ways, and I mean, if you really look carefully at the Chinese, which is the model that is being used in Cuba, we are told the Chinese experience is, uh, yes, it was used to attract foreign investment for exports, but it was also a vehicle for training a national and a Chinese class of entrepreneurs that uh, took root and grew very rapidly in a matter of 15, 20 years. And I, the question that I have in my is whether Cuba is going to also experience or whether the uh, policymakers have a sense of, uh, of, uh, a, a, of commitment to also something like that. And, uh, I'm not sure about Vietnam. That you've been you've been studying Vietnam reforms and their application to Cuba. Uh, it may be interesting to ask ourselves to the, the extent to which Vietnam is also encouraging Vietnamese national capital as opposed to just foreigners uh, and having an enclave economy again returning to in foreign investors. Uh, not very different from the past, is it? Or maquilas or something like that. Unless is there something beyond that that we can look forward to. Um, Well, I mean, again, lots. Just to reaffirm the recent reform, we saw the dual currency ending. I think what I might, what I like to say is just that uh, again, a tale, of, tale of two brothers. Pardon me, New Yorkers. Uh, will Cuba really shift with Raúl, or with, will it stay in this uh, by then? I mean, at the end of 2013, we also saw reaffirmations of, or at least a sense of putting a break on reform process on theaters and you know, three, three, three D theater and homes, uh, selling uh, uh, state merchandise bought at state enterprises and what else, imports, Mario, so certain clothing and so on so on. So, there, so a reaffirmation of restrictions on the non-state sector in three or four main, main areas. So what is happening in Cuba? Is it, do, we, do we have this impulse to reform? which is also accompanied by a sense of a break, a sense of ambivalence, a sense of, gosh, let's preserve socialism. Do we have two forces at play, the two, perhaps, the two brothers, aligned with the two brothers? Well, I just put in the question, there are certainly two sets of views in Cuba, and one of them is reformist, and we can see that in this, in this tale, and one that is uh, not as optimistic about reforms. And I think that's also something to be watched in the months and weeks to come, and I certainly will be looking at this, many of us will be looking at this in a very careful way. But again, the main thing is here is what's happening in Cuba, not what we wish that happens. And we can come back in May and uh, we can address these issues jointly. So at this point, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. And I'd like to